Good afternoon and welcome to Tupa Brai Wagons Fund semi-annual mm-hmm. investor call. At this time, all lines are in listen-only mode. Following the opening remarks, we will conduct a question and answer session. If at any time during this call you require immediate assistance, please press star zero for the operator. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Khan Tran, Fund Distribution Manager at the Pabrai Wagons Fund. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome again to the Pabrai Wagons Fund semi-annual investor call. We are glad you can join us. Before we begin, let us start with the usual disclosures. Mutual fund investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. The fund is non-diversified, meaning it may focus its assets on fewer individual holdings than a diversified fund. Therefore, the fund is more exposed to individual stock volatility than a diversified fund. The fund may invest in small and medium capitalization companies, which involve additional risks such as limited liquidity and greater volatility than larger capitalization companies. The fund is new with limited operating history, and there can be no guarantee that the fund will grow to or maintain an economically viable size. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Opinions expressed are subject to change or not intended to be forecast of future events, a guarantee of future result nor investment advice. Future holdings and allocation are subject to change at any time and should not be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any security. On the call today, we have our portfolio manager, Monish Babrai, our senior analyst and senior vice president, Fahad Mismar, and our vice president, Jaya Velichella. Now, I'd like to hand the call over to Monish Babrai. Thanks, Khan, and welcome shareholders to the second annual, semi-annual investor call of the Pabrai Wagons Fund. I am excited that all of you are on this journey with us as partners and investors. Before we get to your questions, which are my favorite part, I'd like to first say a few words about who we are and where we are today. The Pabrai Wagons Fund launched on September 29th, 2023, almost 12 months ago. The fund seeks to invest in high quality businesses and circles the wagons, quote unquote, around its highest conviction holdings. We look for great franchises that are being offered at substantial discounts to their underlying intrinsic value. When we find them, we try to hold on to them for a long time. From, from time to time, we may invest in special situations like merger arbitrage opportunities where we believe the odds of success weigh heavily in our favor. Our focus is on finding the great businesses wherever they may be around the globe. As of June 30th, 2024, the fund's 27 securities took us to Turkey, the United States, Canada, Europe, China, and Mongolia. We are concentrated with the top five positions, making up over 45% of the fund. Our investments reflect four core allocations, which together accounted for 94% of the portfolio on June 30th, 2024. These four buckets include, uh, first, our Turkish workhorses, like Coca-Cola, ISEC, Anadolu FS, and TAV airports, a handful of U.S. metallurgical and thermal coal businesses, a select few group of U.S. car dealerships, and a select few quality U.S. home builders. I should also add that our first bucket is uh, really, uh, broadly speaking, two separate bets. Uh, One is on uh, these beverage brands, uh, mainly, and the other is uh, on TAV Airport. So it's really almost, you can think of as five buckets instead of four buckets. Most of our investments reflect corners of the market that are out of favor, 
For that reason, they have fallen prey to what we believe is serious mispricing. This pricing dislocation presents us with opportunities to make investments that we believe can compound our capital for years to come. With regard to our performance since inception on September 29, 2023 through August 31, 2024, our retail share class was up 21.54% and our institution share, institutional share class was up 21.86%. The S&P 500 was up 33.5% in the same period. The fund was meaningfully ahead of the S&P 500 six weeks ago, but fell behind in August. Our recent underperformance was due to price action and some of our key holdings, which we believe is temporary. Uh, we are very bullish on the fund's prospects from here. Our singular focus is to beat the S&P 500 over the long, long run. With that in mind, it is important to situate the S&P 500 today in its historical context. In September 2000, the S&P 500 traded at a frothy trailing price to earnings ratio of 25.6. For more than the next 11 years, the S&P 500 delivered near zero returns, inclusive of reinvested dividends. It was not a fun ride. History does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Today, the S&P 500 trades at a trailing PE of 27.2, even higher than its level in 2000, and significantly above its long-term average of 16. It is entirely possible that the S&P 500 continues its upward trajectory for the next few quarters before reverting to its long-term multiple. While the S&P 500 has historically been a great choice for long-term compounding, buying into it at a trailing PE over 25 can be a risky proposition. By contrast, the Pabrai Wagon Fund's underlying portfolio sports a PE of 7.5. I love what we own, and I'm very pleased with how the fund is positioned today. Finally, a note on our brokerage platforms. The Pabrai Wagons Fund is currently available on Vanguard, Interactive Brokers, and Pershing. We are working to be added to Fidelity and Schwab, but both platforms require expressions of interest from their existing customers. So if you are interested in seeing us on Fidelity, Schwab, or any other platform, please email us on info at wagonsfund.com, and we can provide you with more information on what you can do uh, to help us get on these platforms. Uh, we very much appreciate your support on this. And now I will pass the floor over to Fahad Mismar to take us through our pre-submitted questions. Fahad. Thanks, Monish, and thanks to all investors who pre-submitted their questions. The first question is about the fund's investment in Coca-Cola ISIC. CCI has, has faced boycott pressures from consumers in several of its predominantly Muslim countries, given the Coca-Cola company's perceived ties to Israel. In some countries, homegrown cola brands have risen dramatically in popularity, displacing Coke. How do you evaluate this headwind in the context of CCI's long-term prospects? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And uh, Coke has a very old history. Uh, the company's been around for, I think, around 138 years or so. And um, I remember when I was in high school in Dubai, um, uh, Coke was actually uh, banned in uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates um, for uh, somewhat similar reasons uh, to today. I mean, there was a there was a concern then about uh, its uh, ties to Israel and uh, and such. And uh, of course, uh, today and actually for several decades, Coke has been 
uh, now freely available in the United Arab, Arab Emirates and Dubai. So I think in the in the 138-year history of Coke, uh, there's been plenty of countries where, for a variety of reasons, uh, they may temporarily or even for longer periods um, face issues related to geopolitics. And from our from our perspective, these types of uh, these types of uh, situations are difficult. Uh, to handicap and difficult to forecast and difficult to kind of figure out what the trajectory is. Uh, what we are able to hang our hat on is that um, Coke, uh, Coke is sold in uh, 200 countries, and uh, in something like 180 out of the 200 countries, it has leading market share. Uh, it's interesting that the Coca-Cola company on their uh, website uh, highlights uh, uh, countries and regions that they consider um, problematic from a penetration point of view. They're either unhappy with the uh, distribution partner, bottling partner, or in some way are seeking a change uh, to the situation. And amongst these areas that were problematic uh, countries or regions from Coke's perspective used to be uh, Uzbekistan. Um, I think uh, they may still have some concerns about Bangladesh. And most of India, all of India is a concern. now. Uzbekistan uh, is a very interesting case because a few years back um, that bottler uh, came up to sa- came up for sale via an auction, and uh, Coca Cola Isaac was an- encouraged to bid on that um, on that auction, and the Coca Cola company told them that to bid pretty much any price. Uh, to win that concession because they were very unhappy uh, with the bottling arrangement in Uzbekistan. And, of course, Coca-Cola Isaac said that they have a business to run. They can't really play any price, but the Coca-Cola company told them that they would sell them the 50% of the bottler that Coca-Cola company owned uh, uh, in Atlanta at a, at a well below market price in order to make the overall deal palatable, but they really wanted them to get that country. And um, so Coca-Cola Isaac uh, prevailed in that auction. Um, Uzbekistan became, uh, and this just happened, you know, about two, three years ago, Uzbekistan became one of the new countries that was added to Coca-Cola Isaac. And the Coca-Cola company sold their portion of that bottler at a much lower multiple to Coca-Cola Isaac. Analysts at that time were very uh, critical of the transaction, where they said that even with the reduced multiple paid uh, uh, for the Coca-Cola uh, company's share, the overall deal still was very expensive. They had paid something like, uh, something north of $300 million for, um, you know, around $20 million. Uh, of pre-tax earnings. Uh, So it looked like a very rich multiple. If we fast forward to today, which has just been about two or three years since the deal took place, earnings have, I think, more than quadrupled, or there might be uh, pre-tax over 100 million at this point. And so they've gone up four or five times because uh, the bottle was very undermanaged. And uh, it looks like a extremely compelling deal at this point, uh, which is why the Coca-Cola company was so interested in making a change. And uh, Uzbekistan is an example of a bottling franchise that maybe comes up for sale once in 50 years or 100 years or 200 years. Uh, so these, these things don't come along every week. Uh, because these uh, botting arrangements, I mean, certainly I cannot imagine uh, circumstances under which Coca-Cola Isaac would want to sell that 
uh, sell that country's bottling rights. And more recently, um, the Google ISA got uh, approximately half of the country of Bangladesh, uh, which is a which is a very significant market. And um, uh, and so, if we look at Kokol Isaac, I mean, I would say that they are bottling in Pakistan. They are bottling now in Bangladesh. And if you know your geography, India sits in the middle of those two countries. And the Coca-Cola company is unhappy with their bottling arrangements in India. I mean, we view it as low probability, but not a zero probability that in the next few years, there's some possibility that some portion of India, uh, Coca-Cola, I think, might at least get a chance to bid on. And, uh, you know, there are possibilities of a game-changer situation if that were to happen with the most populous country in the world uh, where Pepsi dominates because of the uh, poor showing by Coke. And and so uh, when we look at when we look at the Kogola Isaac bet, uh, we are uh, we are more focused on um, they they brought in uh, really a rock star CEO uh, who we met uh, last year. Uh, really was blown away when we met him. Uh, really surprised that they were they were able to uh, hire someone of his caliber. Uh, Kareem is really exceptional. And uh, and our bet is partially on what Kareem can do with their existing footprint. Uh, Coke is uh, in many ways a simple business, but also in many ways a very complex business. And um, uh, the per capita consumption of Coke is very heavily correlated to per capita GDP and the climate of each country. Um, and there are uh, a lot of underpenetrated regions uh, within uh, Coca-Cola Isaac's footprint, and someone like Kareem could really make a difference there. So I, our our situation is that the uh, the boycotts, et cetera, are kind of difficult to handicap. Uh, we don't think it makes sense for us to uh, exit because of things are, are, are related to that. Uh, I think we just want to play the long game on this front, and uh, we like uh, the power of the brand. We think it travels really well, and uh, we like the management, and we like the uh, the group that has the ownership and the promoter of the company in in Turkey. They're all exceptional, so uh, we hope to uh, keep this investment for a while. Thanks, Monish. Next, we have a few questions about our coal investments. The first one is, I can see significant value in looking at the remaining life of our coal businesses and their ability to continue generating cash returns for us as shareholders until they run out of coal. However, should we account for the volatility of coal prices when assessing their remaining cash flows to arrive at accurate fair value? A year ago, coal companies were generating a lot of cash and returning it to shareholders. The situation has changed today as prices have fallen. How do these swings impact your assessment of the intrinsic value of these businesses? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, last year, uh, when we were first looking at uh, uh, some of the different uh, thermal coal and metallurgical coal businesses. Um, their prices and valuations made no sense to us. Um, they were priced as though uh, they would be out of business in a few years. And uh, I mean, to to give you an example, um, uh, just one of the businesses, uh, Console Energy, uh, which is actually a thermal coal producer, and uh, uh, console is an interesting business because they forward sell um, uh, almost a hundred percent of their uh, sales for the next twelve months are already locked in 
um, and they are also locked in with minimum and maximum uh, prices, floors and ceilings. So um, console, for example, has uh, no possibility of having uh, negative cash flows or any kind of financial issues in the next 12 months. And then when you look out beyond that into year two, about 50% of uh, the output has been sold similarly with contracts and floor and ceiling prices. And we go to year three, it's about 25%. So, and as we move forward, let's say in the next six months to a year, the second year will also get locked in and so on. And uh, and they're a, they're a low-cost producer with some of the highest quality uh, thermal coal. And this thermal coal has many uses uh, globally that are uh, unrelated to the production of power. And they are critical uh, resources required uh, for those industrial applications. So console, uh, when we had looked at it last year, I think had a market cap of like 1.8 billion or so. And it was a business that was unlikely to pretty much ever have a year where their cash flows would be less than 200 or 250 million. And uh, it was likely to have many years where those cash flows might be north of 500 million. And this, if we just consider 250 to 500 million, though it could even be higher than that, uh, of these cash flows for several decades, we didn't think that a 1.8 or 2 billion market cap uh, made sense in terms of the discounted cash flows coming out. And uh, when we had looked at the different coal businesses, we stress tested our different scenarios and and we absolutely understood that there could be periods where pricing could be weak and cash flows could be weak and cash flows could even be negative and we considered the situation of what it might do to the franchise value and equity value of these companies long term, and uh, we we concluded that uh, all of these businesses that we've invested in for pretty much the first time in the history of these various businesses, um, they have no debt. Uh, they are net cash positive. And typically, mining businesses historically have never been like that. They've always been highly levered. And it's usually the leverage that's done them in because basically when the downturn comes and their cash flows are stressed, they do not have an ability to service the debt, uh, which leads to a restructuring and bankruptcy and so on and so forth. Um, these companies all went through some serious um, stresses in the last decade or two. And of course, their situation today is very reversed where they are actually net cash. And also what these companies have done for the most part is that uh, the ones that are buying back shares have very strict requirements of minimum cash below which they are unwilling to go, even if their stock price is very attractive. And uh, so we really couldn't see a scenario where the franchise value or the equity value and the, uh, or the ownership that we have would be threatened long-term uh, during periods when cash flows are weak. One of the things about uh, this business is there's an asymmetry. So if we look at the metallurgical coal producers, uh, today, for example, 
the main index, the uh, premier low wall PLV index uh, in Australia, uh, which is the primary index globally, is uh, currently at about $185 uh, per ton. It recently bottomed out at $176 per ton. At the $185 per ton, a significant amount of U.S. production is underwater. Uh, they're not able to cover their cash costs. And uh, many of these players um, have very healthy balance sheets because uh, in the recent past, coal prices were very strong after the war in Ukraine and so on. So they have an ability to, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, withstand low prices for some time. But uh, already, for example, something, uh, something on the order of, um, well, we think around like maybe 5 or 10 million tons of um, uh, at least around 10 million tons of uh, of uh, capacity outside of our holdings um, is underwater, likely to shut down. And when these uh, when these mines shut down, the asymmetry is that uh, they really have a lot of difficulty coming back. So if I were to contrast this with some other industries, like let's say, for example, the office building industry. So historically what has happened in in commercial real estate, like offices, for example, office towers, is um, things get tight, there isn't much availability, and uh, rents start to go up a lot. And almost at the same time, a large number of new office towers are uh, proposed and announced and construction begins. And it takes about five years for these office towers to come online. And so typically what we'd have about five years after a major boom is you would have a glut of supply because all these towers are coming on, on uh, going live at about the same time and rents collapse. And then when rents collapse, there's a freeze on new construction because economically it makes no, no sense, like what we have today in the office market in the U.S. Uh, there's a serious uh, glut of space, and uh, there isn't much new construction going on in in offices. But basically, uh, there is no s- structural uh, uh, situation that prevents new office towers from being announced and built when rents are high. In the coal business, what happens is that when prices collapse, like we have right now, and a mine is shut down, basically the equipment gets pulled out, uh, the workers are let go, the permits are are gone, and that mine, mine is not operating. So the PLB 185 or 175, that mine, let's say, is not operating. And let's say at some point uh, the index rose to 250 or 300 or 350, at which point that particular mine would be very profitable. Um, It does not really have an ability to come back uh, at that point because uh, equipment lead times today, which are not boom times, today equipment lead times are two years. If there were a boom in, (coughs) excuse me, if there was a boom in uh, coal prices, those equipment lead times would be further stretched out, could be even three years or four years. Um, So you can't get the equipment. And the workers are not available. Uh, so mine, mine workers who were let go, they may have retired or gone to another profession or whatever else. When you're, when you're trying to hire specialist miners, uh, you cannot create them overnight. And so the workers are not available. And then the capital also is not available because if the index is at 300, uh, there's no 
uh, you know, nothing written in stone that six months from now, one year from now, or three years from now, it will still be 300. So um, uh, debtors are not willing to provide uh, uh, capital, you know, investors are not willing to provide uh, debt capital. And equity capital is also not available because uh, of the volatility of coal prices. And coal is a four-lettered word. Uh, a lot of banks and a lot of uh, financial institutions will not invest in coal, even if the economics are great. So for a variety of reasons, uh, when this production goes away, as we are seeing it go away currently, um, that production is not coming back. And... Um, the met coal markets are slightly, I would say, undersupplied or fairly supplied. There is no real oversupply. And so when we get uh, any kind of a, even a modest tailwind, um, prices would go up a lot and supply would not be able to respond. So it is it is our view that um, our businesses that we've invested in have very strong financials. Uh, we don't see any of them having any stress uh, at current uh, prices and current, uh, you know, index prices and all of that. And I think they'll be a strong beneficiary uh, when things turn. So when we did our, our work on the coal businesses, we considered a variety of situations in terms of cash flows, uh, negative cash flows, modest cash flows, uh, euphoric cash flows, and, uh, you know, stress tested these businesses. And we didn't really see any kind of uh, uh, modest or high probability that these businesses would have, uh, you know, a bit, an inability to survive uh, these uh, these volatile times. So we like the bet and we would keep them. Thanks, Monish. Uh, what are your thoughts on the merger of Arch Resources with Console Energy? Are you bullish on the combined entity? They have been better off as separate entities. Is it a negative that the companies cannot buy back shares until after the merger? And how will this merger ultimately affect the Wagons Fund? Yeah, we were surprised when uh, the the merger was announced, and uh, and uh, we we were shareholders, of course, in both companies, uh, and uh, we obviously like both businesses. One of the big positives that comes around when you put these two companies together is it reduces the odds considerably that there would be any meaningful periods in the future where the combined business would have negative or stressed cash flows. So, for example, if you look at the current situation today in uh, the coal markets, the thermal coal markets are quite healthy. Um, the API2 indices, which are what a lot of thermal businesses tied on, is in a wealthy, very healthy place right now, and console is producing very healthy cash flows at this point. Um, uh, Arch uh, Resources, which is uh, predominantly a met coal producer, um, it it has what what they call long wall met coal operations, and it's a low cost producer. Um, it, it's um, it's uh, it sits fairly low on the cost curve. So even in a current uh, 185 PLV, Arch is um, cash flow positive when a lot of U.S. players are not cash flow positive. So uh, today, if the companies were combined, there would be very healthy cash flows coming out of these of this entity. Both companies had uh, bought into. Um, basically reducing or eliminating their dividends and uh, not really focused on anything else other than using their cash flows to buy back shares. And both of the companies' uh, stock prices are quite undervalued relative to the cash flows they are likely to produce for the next several decades. Uh, so 
basically, um, we would be surprised if the combined entity uh, really ends, uh, runs into any periods, any meaningful periods in the future where they uh, have stressed cash flows and are unable to do buybacks. We think that scenario would be quite remote because I, I already said that console, for example, forward sells a year in advance and they lock in those margins. Um, Arch forward sells with floating prices, but because they sit low on the cost curve, uh, they would likely always be making money. And the combined company, I think, would always be making money. And we think, so, you know, if you think of a combined entity around, you know, five billion odd market cap, uh, we think in a bad year, they would produce something like 500 million of cash flow. And in a good year, could produce over a billion in cash flow. And if you just think of a company that's buying back 10 to 20% of its shares every year, uh, you know, that's a spectacular situation. Now, I don't think they'll be able to, uh, I don't think the stock market cap will be 5 billion when they are producing more than 100 million a month in cash flow, I think the market would adjust the uh, would adjust the market cap. But you know, from our perspective on a total return basis, that's fine with us. I mean, actually, I would prefer if the market cap stayed low. But overall, uh, we think that's a worthwhile bet for us to make, and we like to keep those companies for as long as we can. Thanks, Monish. Uh, the next question is. What gives you confidence or what mental model are you using to avoid investing in NVIDIA amidst an AI boom where NVIDIA is the only play, only real player? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that when, when I look at any businesses, and I would say many parts of NVIDIA would be outside my circle of competence. So that'd be the first reason that uh, we wouldn't, uh, we don't have an investment in NVIDIA. But the thought exercise that I would want to run with uh, a business like NVIDIA, um, you know, I think uh, NVIDIA recently had a market cap that was uh, north of north of three billion, and uh, it's gone it's gone down uh, a little bit. It's about two point eight billion or so now. Uh, I mean, sorry, 2.8 trillion. It was over 3 trillion. Uh, so it's a thousand x different. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so it has a 3 trillion or let's say 2.8 trillion market cap. And the thought experiment I'd like to run, you know, in order to make an investment to, in it is I need, would need to have some kind of a conviction on what would be the cash flows coming out of NVIDIA um, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and then, you know, discount those back um, uh, to some so uh, some some reasonable number. Now, uh, NVIDIA is currently producing something like $60 billion a year, uh, approximately. I mean, these are approximate, but I really haven't spent a lot of time in the company, so my numbers are very approximate. Um, so they're producing about $60 billion a year. Um, and their growth in cash flows, which has been very spectacular in the last few years, is slowing down. So if those cash flows were to grow at something like 100% a year for the next several years, um, NVIDIA is cheap on a $2.8 trillion market cap. In other words, if uh, two or three years from now, uh, the 60 billion of cash flow in a single year is 200 billion or 300 uh, billion or maybe five years from now is five or 600 uh, billion. Um, that would be a cheap stock. Uh, but there is not enough data that I have uh, that would prompt me to uh, come to the conclusion that those types of cash flows are possible or realistic for a company like NVIDIA. Um, I was reading 
the most recent issue of Barron's uh, just came out on September 16th. They had an article on a company that used to be called Slumberjay, which is in the oil field services business. And the article was pointing out that in the 1980s, um, Slumberjay was the NVIDIA of the 1980s. Uh, its stock price rise in the 1980s resembled the stock price rise that we've seen in NVIDIA more recently. And um, over the last three and a half decades, so the market cap, at least what this article was saying, the market cap of Slumberjay around 1990 was about 60 billion. And today, it is around 60 billion. Now, they've issued dividends over the years, but um, I don't think most of us would compare it a home run that if you held it from 1990 till today, that your analyzed return would be better than the S&P or anything like that. I think it would be terrible. And um, my brother uh, in high school in Dubai had interned at uh, Slumberjays. Uh, their Middle East headquarters were in Dubai at the time, so he was a you know he was a you know 17 or 18 year old intern in the company in their accounting department or something. So I've, I've known of the business uh, for north of 40 years. And it's a very high quality company and it provides very essential services. Um, but you know, the nature of equity markets is think, things can get euphoric. And uh, if, if a business like NVIDIA with the 60 billion of cash flow and what I understand about AI, were available, for example, for $200 billion. even someone like me might be able to go long on it because I could probably see that the cash flows might be um, strong enough to make it a bargain. But the $60 billion versus the $2.8 trillion, uh, you know, I think just uh, makes it difficult uh, with my juvenile understanding of the business. Uh, thanks, Monish. Um, I think now uh, we we can open the floor up to a few questions from the audience for the remaining time of the call. Uh, so I'll hand it over to our operator. Thank you. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star followed by the number one on your touchstone phone. You will hear a prompt that your hand has been raised. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press star followed by the number two. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure to lift the handset before pressing any keys. One moment while we prepare our Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Harry Wu, private investor. Your line is now open. Hi, Manish. Uh, could you share a little bit about your uh, investment in Oxy in the fund? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, our, our, uh, when, we, when we started the, the Pabrai Wagons Fund uh, late uh, September last year, um, you know, mutual funds are very different from the way we run our uh, – I run our – private partnerships and so on, they have um, a number of, uh, and rightly so, they have a number of diversification rules, et cetera. Um, the least number of positions that we could have under the trust that we have these funds under would be something like um, 15 or 16 positions, more, real, more realistically around 20 to 30 positions. And um, usually in, uh, in a year, um, you know, historically, we can come up with, you know, one, two, three, or four ideas. And um, uh, we certainly uh, 
cannot come up with 30 ideas or 20 ideas is the nature of, you know, the speed at which I do things. And uh, so uh, we, what we had done at that point was that uh, when you look at our positions, there would be some that are very high conviction ideas. We've known these businesses for a while. We've had them as investments elsewhere and so on. And so we could populate the fund with those when we got going. Uh, we had a choice of keeping the fund significantly in cash or having some what I would consider placeholders. And uh, so, for example, um, uh, we used to have uh, Berkshire Hathaway as a placeholder. Holder. You know, familiar with the business, I think it's a, a low downside, uh, very well managed, et cetera. But it does not, from my vantage point, have the same upside potential that, for example, some of our coal bets would have. And um, Oxy uh, falls into that category. I'm familiar with the business. It's an extremely well-run company with a very strong position in the Permian uh, with their fracking. And in fact, they have been uh, the low-cost producer in the Permian and actually done a lot of innovations. Uh, Vicky Holub is a, a truly uh, a once-in-a-generation exceptional manager. And uh, the main determinant of what happens to, uh, in terms of future returns for Oxy, uh, the biggest uh, driver would be uh, oil prices. And uh, we don't really have, uh, you know, a crystal ball which tells us, you know, that oil prices will be strong in the future. But what we do know is that um, the U.S., for, for example, I think the U.S. is producing 11 or 12 million barrels a day. Uh, we are uh, the largest producer in the world now, which is spectacular, wonderful. But more than half that production is fracked production from shale, shale oil. And these wells, the shale oil wells, are very different from the historic way oil has been produced for more than the last 100 years or so. Um, you know, there are oil fields which, you know, like I think Charlie had, Charlie Munger had a royalty interest in some oil field in, um, in uh, Bakersfield which he had bought for something like $1,000 or something 50, 60 years ago. And even now he was getting something like 70000 a year in royalty payments and dividends from that oil field, which wasn't expected to last this long, but it did. But the fracked oil fields, so coming from shale oil, those run out in 12 to 18 months. They run out very quickly. So basically... It's like you're on a treadmill. I mean, all the, the return characteristics are exceptional on those oil fields in terms of uh, capital you're putting, putting in versus your returns at $80 or $70 WTI. It's a great business. If oil prices were to go down meaningfully, um, the fracked portion of the oil produced globally would dry up really quickly. And uh, and even maybe some conventional production and uh, exploration, et cetera, would go down. So it's very different in terms of the way production changes with oil prices today versus uh, the pre fracked era. So some, some of this is similar to the coal business of the asymmetry. So... Uh, uh, we think that the oxy bet, uh, like I said, we put it more as a placeholder, was a uh, low risk bet. Uh, it had some, it has upside built in for when prices go up and when prices go down. Uh, I think they are uh, more resilient than most others. So that's why we have that bet uh, in the portfolio. It's not a big bet; it's less than four percent.
Your next question comes from the line of Edward Brown, private investor. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks for holding the call. But I'd, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on the home builder industry that uh, comprises one of the four uh, core allocations. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, we own a few home builders, and um, we think they're all very high quality businesses. And uh, we think they're misunderstood. And people tend to think of the home building business as cyclical, and we don't think they're as cyclical as people think they are. So the the U.S. has a shortage, depending on who you talk to, of something north of five million homes. Uh, so you know we were we were overproducing a lot of homes leading up to the financial crisis in 2007, and I think we were we were producing well above uh, the one and a half million. Uh, housing units, new housing units we need as a country every year at that point. And so there was a big glut uh, at that point. But uh, what happened after that, if you look at the kind of statistics of kind of the number of homes that got built in 08, 09, 10, 11, and so on, and, you know, fast forward and carry it on to today, um, we have not averaged uh, anywhere near the one and a half million, and that overhang was absorbed a long time ago. And we basically have a shortage of housing units, which is why you get this kind of rhetoric from presidential candidates that we're going to build five million homes or something, which is, from my point of view, a pipe dream, not going to happen. Um, you know, you can't just flip a switch on these things. So. The home builders have two or three things going on, which we think are secular trends uh, that play um, to the to the benefit of the large national players. Uh, the first is that um, home building used to be very uh, fragmented. It still is pretty fragmented, but it's consolidated a lot, uh, where a few large players have uh, the largest market share they've ever had. And the reason they have the largest market share they've ever had is because they have economies of scale. So when we look at a Pulte or a Toll Brothers or, uh, you know, some of these other names like TriPoint, uh, et cetera, that we have in our portfolio, um, they have a structural advantage over the mom and pop players. They have a structural advantage in terms of their cost of capital. Um, they can borrow at, you know, 5 6%, and a private player would, trying to do something is going to be borrowing at, you know, double digits, 15% or something. So they've got uh, much higher uh, costs on the financing side. Uh, they've also got a big advantage in terms of their cost of production. Uh, so home builders now look a lot like just-in-time manufacturing. Um, basically, they, um, they'll put up a few models. Uh, they've, they've, they've basically got people walking through these models, signing contracts, and, you know, some of them do spec building, uh, but, you know, all of their spec homes are mostly sold uh, before they're, they're completed, but a large portion is basically they start the work after this, a buyer who signed on, which means basically that uh, uh, there's not that much uh, of their equity capital going in. And the other thing that uh, many of these players have done is they're backward integrated. Uh, so uh, NVR was a pioneer in this, where um, a number of you know portions of the home which would be built on site are now built in kind of manufacturing type production facilities and then uh, trucked over to the home site at a much lower cost um, than doing it on site. So basically, uh, and then uh, I think that on the, in the equity market side, 
um, just like with the auto dealers, the market caps do not reflect the long-term cash flows and growth of these businesses relative to their market caps. So we think they are a very good bet because they are very good uh, stewards of capital. Um, most of them are heavily fixated on buybacks. Uh, I mean, one of them, like, you know, TriPoint is uh, 100% buybacks, no dividend. They bought back more than half their shares in the last few years. And uh, so I think that's our, our thesis there is uh, these are very high-quality businesses. They're not as cyclical as people think they are. Uh, there's a big shortage of uh, quality homes. The large players have an advantage. And uh, so, yeah, we like the position. Your next question comes from the line of Prasad Raju, private investor. Your line is now open. Hey, Manish. Thanks for taking this question. Uh, just wanted to ask you about the investments in Turkey. Um, just wanted to get your thought on since the time the fund initially invested in these companies, uh, do you believe they are still significantly uh, mispriced as, at this time? Yeah, I think some of our highest conviction bets uh, are in Turkey. If you look at our portfolio uh, at the end of June, uh, the top three bets are all in Turkey. And the top three bets, which is TAB is the biggest one, the airport operator, the Andalou FS is number two, and Coca-Cola Isaac is number three. These three collectively are over 33%. Uh, yeah, I think just exactly 33% of the fund, so just slightly below one-third. And um, we like that position. I think they're all exceptional businesses. I think they're very undervalued. I think they're very strong management teams, very strong franchise values, great brands, and um, a large footprint of earnings and cash flows that comes outside of Turkey. So we are very happy with that holding and uh, they are amongst the highest conviction that we have of anything in the portfolio. Your next question comes from the line of Elias Moses, private investor. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you, Manish. Uh, nice to speak with you. Uh, I have a, a couple of questions. First of all, um, why do you decide um, that um, home builders um, to, to buy them? I know that, uh, as you mentioned, they are consolidated in the markets, and certainly it can be a linear, um, uh, just um, told uh, they are Horton, that are, we can say they have a little bit more advantage since uh, the size and what they change about light model instead of the heavy model that they had in, 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 in the past. Uh, why you decide that? That's the first question. And the second question: Why? What if it may um, change your mind in in uh, Turkey, since it can be a risk of uh, capital flows or anything that might deteriorate your thesis of investment? That it might change your mind and say, well, even though that it's a great uh, companies, all of them that you put it. Um, and you say, well, maybe it's 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 can it's it's not an investable in some sense, not because of the companies, it's because of the government that it might change the way they they you can pull out in I don't know in years or decades your money out after you decide that it's already uh, a good investment, but it's it's not investable in some way. Yeah, those are good questions. So. When we look at our large holdings, I'll just take the second one first. Uh, when we look at our large holdings in Turkey, uh, these companies, like if I let's look at the airport operator, you know, TAB Airports. Um, TAB Airports has 
a significant amount of its revenue and cash flows coming from outside Turkey. And um, these are separate uh, uh, subsidiaries. In some cases, they are joint ventures with other entities. And uh, quite frankly, those cash flows uh, are outside of Turkey, and they are ring-fenced, if you will. So in a situation that you are bringing up, which I think would be extremely low probability, uh, but in the event that even that extreme low probability event comes to pass, uh, we don't believe that their uh, non-Turkish assets uh, would be in any way impaired. And uh, we also think that their Turkish assets are so critical to the functioning of the country and the economy. Uh, like if I look at the airport operator, Tav Airports, that, uh, in their case, they are contractually, even within Turkey, getting all revenues in euros, almost all revenue in euro, and a lot of the costs are in liras. Um, uh, those are contracts with the government. Uh, those are mission critical airports. Uh, so uh, we don't think that there would be a situation where, uh, I, I mean, so this is a very difficult to imagine an impairment which would take us below our current or our average cost, et cetera. Um, and the same with Anadolu FS. I mean, they are the largest beer company in Russia and Ukraine and half a dozen other countries. Uh, those are very uh, strong markets by a huge order of magnitude. Their beer volumes outside Turkey um, are massively more than the beer volumes inside Turkey. Uh, the same thing is ring fenced, and the same thing with Coppola ISAC. Their uh, bottling volumes outside Turkey are meaningfully above the volumes inside Turkey. So, even if you take a you know kind of draconian situation of uh, something happening of you know where there's some capital flow issues or whatever. We don't believe that the companies get impaired to the point of going below our cost basis or anything like that. I think so that's low probability. I think the home builders, we covered most of it, but yeah, uh, they've all, in a very slow way, uh, many decades after they should have done it, gotten NVR, NV, uh, and they've, uh, you know, taken a capital light approach to the business, which is wonderful. They're not gone. They haven't gone all the way like NVR has, but they've gone a long way. So, so uh, all of them are moving towards more than half the lots that are controlled being optioned, et cetera, and working with partners for land banks and all all that. So yeah, I, mean, I think uh, uh, I think those uh, the home building uh, business is a very good business. Uh, it's uh, uh, misunderstood and undervalued, and the companies are very strong, uh, good stewards of capital and doing a good job. So we like the position. Maybe we can take one more question. Your last question comes from the line of Jason Muhlenkamp, private investor. Please go ahead. Thank you for hosting these calls. Uh, just a would like you to discuss the fund's holdings in Greece. Thank you. I'm sorry, the fund holding in, you said Greece? Uh, yes, Greece, I would think the Nouse Corp. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, we don't have any holdings in Greece. Uh, Danos. Oh, oh, I, oh, you're talking about the, the shipping company. Danos? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 we have, we have one position uh, in Greece, uh, yeah, they're headquartered in Athens, uh, uh, Danos Corporation. And uh, uh, Danos is more like, I mean, I think it's a very well-run company. It's more like a special situation uh, where if you study the business, you will find that they have uh, locked-in cash flows uh, that are a large portion of their market cap. Um, and uh, 
so we think that uh, because of the uh, so equity markets hate uncertainty and they heavily punish uncertainty and uh, so Danos, for example, currently is a beneficiary of the fact that ships uh, cannot go through the Suez Canal and they have to go around Africa. And that has increased uh, the, uh, the demand and number of days that a ship's on the water for a given voyage and caused tightness in availability and uh, led to significant increases in the daily rates of these ships. And so in the case of Danos, they have locked in contracts and cash flows, uh, which are um, almost, you can take it to the bank. I mean, those are pretty much, you know, with the, with the largest uh, uh, lines, et cetera. And so I, we just think that it's, uh, it's just not reflected appropriately in the market cap. And so that's why we have that position. And uh, thank you so much for all your questions. I really enjoy these calls. And uh, also, thank you so much for your support and interest in the Wagons Fund. Great. Once again. Ladies and Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you very much for your participation. You may now disconnect.